Dr. Poonam is an FRC. She's a fellow of the Royal College of Ophthalmology with special interest in ocular plastic surgery and pediatric ophthalmology and the diabetic eye. She's a graduate, postgraduate certified from in medical education and is a trained medical hypnotherapist and a mentor certified by the Institute of Management and Learning. She is also a qualified teacher and mentor for mindfulness-based stress reduction. Poonam. Poonam is a very dear friend of mine and we are college mates, medical college mates from Harding, New Delhi. I have attended her paid programs earlier and was very amazed to find that another person whom I used to follow and consider as my mentor was actually following her and using her as her mentor. So, um, Jute Poonam will be speaking to us. Welcome, Poonam. Thank you, Neetra. Thank you for those very kind words. Hello, everyone. So, I'm Poonam, and I am by profession a trained ophthalmologist. But when I was uh, seeing my patients, I realized that the disease is only a small part of their personality. It was the impact of chronic disease on their psyche that I became very, very interested in. And with that, I uh, trained in medical hypnotherapy. And as I was looking after a lot of medical students and was uh, uh, named mentor for them, I went ahead and did a um, certificate in level seven certificate, which is a postgrad level certificate in coaching and mentoring. And today I'm bringing to you the power of love. The reason for my introducing that topic to people is because I find that most of us in a very constricted state. So, and people haven't thought about their reactivities. They haven't thought about what it is that they are feeling and sensing. Because most of the times we reside in our minds, in our brains, in our thoughts. We rarely drop into our body, and yet the mind-body continuum is such a critical one that once we learn to tap into the body, we can actually change our neural pathways. So that now is being called neuroplasticity. When we were in med school, it, we were taught that, oh, once the brain is formed, it can't change. That has now been proven wrong by lots and lots of medical studies, functional MRI images, and the evidence is building up constantly. So today I'm bringing to you as to how to maximize your life potential. And that doesn't include just your career, but really your personal and professional lives by thinking about yourselves and about thinking about love. So <clears throat> I'm just going to open my presentation. It's not available to you, but it will be sent to you. Um, so my question to you, this is a question to you, and obviously we are not having an interactive session here, but I would like you to start, pause and think as to what does love mean to you? When you think or hear the word or visualize it, what comes up for you? Where exactly in the body do you feel anything when you think about the word love? And this is something, you know, when we intellectualize, it's one thing, but when we experience it, it's a completely different phenomenon. So I am requesting that everybody just pauses and thinks as to what is it that love means to you. The dictionary defines love as a feeling of deep affection. And when we are in that state of deep affection and dedication to ourselves or to another, the flow of the body changes. So what are the qualities that love brings? There are many different types of love. So there is the love between the parents and the child. There's the love between siblings, love between friends. And then there is the love between partners, especially in the early days. So there are many, many different neurotransmitters which are responsible, but, but the two that stand out are dopamine, and oxytocin. My talk here today is 
going to concentrate on making people contemplate as to where they are in their journeys. So neuroscientifically, we know that when we feel love, we want to do something for that other person. We are ready to do anything for that other person. And in fact, if we were to talk superficially, most people would say, oh, I love my children unconditionally. But then if you went to your children, what is their perception? Do they think that you'd love them unconditionally? And that is where the dis discernment is with the parents and with the child. So there was in the 1940s, there was an American physiologist called Abraham Maslow. And Maslow did a lot of work on how people feel and perceive and then designed what's called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So he decided five levels and it's presented as a pyramid. The most, the lowest most level is our basic needs, needs for water, air, food, housing. The next level is about our need of belonging. So safety, do we feel safe in an environment? And even though most people think that we are very safe when we are children in our home environments where we are well looked after by our parents, our grandparents, sometimes the child's personality is different. And whilst the parents may think they're providing a safe env environment, that actually may not be happening. And that can lead to uh, minor or major traumas. And I'll come back to that. So that is safety need. And the third level is love, love and belonging. So how well does a child settle in a family? Sometimes as parents, we think, oh, our child is very well established in the family system. But um, especially with alpha parents or parents who have lots of expectations, the child may find it really hard. And also if a child personality is different from the parents' personality and the parents don't have a perception or understanding of that, it can really sometimes be quite um, challenging for the child to fit into the family because they're always trying to please the parent and not succeeding. And both, this is happening at the subconscious level. So both are unaware of this dynamic. And that is something else to think about. So in the world of psychology now, there is a lot about how our personalities are wired. So that is, we are born with a certain personality. A very simple example of that would be uh, introverts and extroverts. So introverts think completely differently, differently from extroverts. And it, this is a world of extroverts. You know, people who talk a lot, who, are very happy in big groups. Unfortunately for introverts, unless the extroverts in the group begin to understand them, they become the silent minority. So, and I'm an extrovert. It took me a long time and a lot of contemplation to realize that those people around me who were introverts, they weren't getting a chance to give their opinions, speak up their minds. And I actually had to retrain my brain to pause and let people, especially in meetings, let people speak. My daughter is an introvert and I'm an extrovert. And that again, it took me a long time to realize that her personality is very, very different from mine. And how I have to actually engage with her because I was forever giving advice and she didn't actually need advice because she had her own inner system of solving issues, but I was thinking, oh, this would work better. And that is something all parents need to be aware of. How often are we going into the advice mode? The reason why I say that is even as children are growing up, they actually have an inner resource of their own. And as long as we are watching them carefully with love and acceptance without criticism, they will know what to do. 
So, you know, you might find a child touches something and we are saying, oh, don't go near the heat, don't go near the heat, you'll get hurt. Yes, we have to be careful. But if we allow that child in a safe environment to touch something hot, they will know next time not to do it. But of course, we have to ensure that they are safe. As adults, that's our role. So the important thing here is really to be thinking about ourselves. Very early in my mentoring career and coaching career, I started to look at personality typing. There are many different tests for personality typing, but the one that I find the most useful is called MBTI. And then there's another one called Enneagram. People think that personality typing is to tell you what kind of a person you are. And to some extent it is, but they often feel very boxed in and then they don't know what to do with once the personality typing has been done, what to do with it. This is very much a developmental tool. So once you know what your strengths are, you learn to play those up. You see what works for you and you take note of the small steps within what is working and repeat those behaviors. But equally now you start to pay attention to where is it that you're tripping? What is it that's not working for you? And then you start to make small changes with awareness. So like I said, I'm an extrovert. In meetings, I would want to speak whatever goes in my head. And sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, my introverted colleagues would stay quiet, even though they had better ideas. Some, and then I stopped doing that once I had become aware of that trait. And I would just state an opinion and then pause and ask for their views. And that became a much more holistic meeting then. We were getting, and we started to look at all team members and we did personality testing to find out how we could put, maximize our team working productivity. And that worked really well because in every team, there is a person with a big vision and then there's a detail-oriented person. The detail-oriented person can often not see the end point with the big picture. So the two need to work together. And that happens even at home. You know, like when we have, in our very close family systems, we often have conflict about that, but that's because we think, oh, my spouse doesn't understand me or my child doesn't understand my intent. But when we pause and look at what is it that we are doing, which could be different, then we will make probably different choices. So with that, I'm going to move on to talking about um, understanding yourself. So my question to you today is, what exactly do you think your values are? We live by certain values. Those are the things which are very dear to our heart and we live those values. But quite often we haven't teased those values out. So an example of a value would be honesty. Another one would be authenticity. At work and even in our personal lives, it could be punctuality. So when I speak about honesty, most people say they are very honest and they like to believe that. But then if I were to deep dive into it and ask, okay, suppose your friend wasn't wearing a, was wearing a dress that you didn't like, but asked, oh, do you, what do you think of this dress? It's highly unlikely that people would say, oh, I don't like it. So that, are we really honest? Okay, we are being kind, but are we really honest? So we need to examine our values and really know them for ourselves. And if I say to most people, oh, we, we are all judgmental. And they say, no, 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 I'm not judgmental. That's another one that really requires thinking because it's wired into our subconscious. We have been brought up from our childhood about making judgments. So judgment is different from discernment. As doctors, we make judgments all the time because we have knowledge. We put that knowledge together. We uh, decide uh, patterns and then we make our treatment choices. So that could be called judgment, but that is knowledge-based judgment. 
Then there is judgment about, like, you know, if you were to look at the Indian newspapers in, when we were young, where, yeah, we want a fair complexion right. Now that's a judgment as well. Or if I uh, talk about my child and make a judgment, I might say to them, what are you doing in school? Now I have asked a very open question, but based on their previous experience, they might perceive that question as a judgmental question, unbeknown to us, because they are receiving that question in the light of our previous behaviors. So we need to be thinking about our values really carefully, because most of us haven't teased those values out. And uh, there are a number of values, but each person has a different set. And usually we live by two or three big values. We may have lots of subsidiary ones, but those are the ones that we live from. I'm coming back to now, again, love. So I talk about self-love and self-compassion a lot. The reason for that is that when my own need isn't met, when I'm feeling unrecognized, then the chances are that I'm resentful about that. And when I'm resentful, I'm not giving my full self to the outer world. If you take a cup and it's empty and you try to pour from it, nothing's going to come from it. So most of us as high level medics are extremely busy in our professional lives and we are juggling multiple balls. So there's very little time left for self-nurturing. And in fact, we don't even think about it because it's thought of as quite often confused with selfishness. The two are very, very different. Selfishness is where you put your selfish need ahead of others. Self-love is where you accept yourself as you are. You recognize this is my need in this moment. It may not be, you may not be able to fulfill that need, but at least you recognize it. And if you're not able to fulfill it, you ask yourself, what is it that's stopping me from meeting my own need? And also going deeper inside to find from yourself, how is your interaction with your other people at work, at home, in the general world? Because whenever there is resentment within us, the energy that's flowing in us changes. So there are many, many different kinds of love, like I said, but the starting point is self-love. You will often find that people who are critical of themselves have low self-esteem, but they are very frequently critical of others as well. And it's not conscious, it's never conscious. It's always at the limbic brain level. And the reason for that is the limbic brain perceives any, any challenge, which is somebody talking to me loudly, somebody criticizing a piece of work or a comment which is very casual, but has been perceived by me as criticism. All those stimuli are perceived by the limbic brain as challenges to survival. And it goes into a state of low stress. And when there is chronic low stress, our cortisol levels are chronically high with all the subsequent uh, chains of reaction. And therefore, it is really important to start looking at how is it that we are thinking and reacting. And that then brings me back to how we live in our minds because we are often in a loop of thoughts. Somebody has said something to me. I will think, why did they say that? Uh, they shouldn't have said that. I am so good and they are not recognizing my worth. The way to come out of that is actually to go into your body and see where is it that you're feeling that sensation. Like, you know, it may be a tightness in our chest. It may be some butterflies in our stomach. It may be queasiness. Once we begin to recognize that, and we also begin to recognize the critical chatter in our head, we are able to change that. Uh, Nisha, will you tell me when to stop? Uh, you're on mute. 
another five minutes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I what I'm requesting all those people that I'm now meeting is to look at how is it that they feel love and where is it that they feel love in the body. So often when we are in a state of deep love, like when we are in the small child, you know, the, uh, our heart seems to open up and we have that feeling of expansion. When we don't have that feeling, that is when we need to go within and ask, okay, what is it that's happening? Before I end, I just want to do a two or three minute meditation to acquaint you with how to drop into the body. So if, if there are any questions, just put them in the chat and then I will try to answer those. But remember my, my example of an empty cup? Remember Maslow's hierarchy? That was researched very well and it's often used in corporate sector, but not in the way that I'm explaining it. But if my basic need hasn't been met, then it's very difficult for me to meet other people's need. So you will, I have seen patients and I have seen families where there has been trauma, like a, uh, a child has lost a parent. And even though there may be a lot of surrogate carers, the safety that a child gets with having a constant mother around is different. And that child will come up with a, you know, grow up with a lot of unrecognized stress. And when they are adults, their behavior will be different from somebody who's been brought up in a nurturing two-parent family. So as the time is, yeah, and somebody asked, is reptilian, uh, limbic brain the same as reptilian brain? Absolutely. Uh, so reptilian brain is the most basic brain and it reacts to challenges. Our cortex, our frontal cortex is the exact brain. When we train it, we can stop the limbic brain from coming into reactions. But most of the times, in fact, 95% of the times, it's our limbic brain that's functioning. And that's the hidden um, or the submerged iceberg. Our cortex has to be trained very well. That is the brain which reacts. Yes, that's the reactive brain. It's That's why it's called the reptilian brain. Like if you are close to a lizard, it just looks out of its complex eye and runs without assessing the situation. And when we are in that limbic brain reaction, we are in the sympathetic overdrive. So we need to bring the parasympathetic in to balance that. And we do that by um, activating our vagal nerves because so with the meditation, we activate our vagal nerves to balance the sympathetic. So it's not that we'll never react, we will react because that's how we are wired until we begin to train ourselves. And that is the time when we can bring the parasympathetic mode. There, there is a lot about deactivation mode network and things like that, but that's for another time. So as we have just a little time left, I'll do a very short meditation. So I'm inviting all of you to notice how you're sitting on your chairs and actually observing the posture of your body and straightening your spine. Watching how your, your back is in contact with the back of the chair and how you're being supported by the seat of the chair. And then as you hear the words that I'm speaking, I invite you to take a deep breath in. And as you breathe in, observe the touch of the air to the nostrils and the inside of your nose. All of us have different points in the nose on the nasal mucosa, which will be stimulated. So notice for yourself, where is it that the air is touching you? And as you breathe in, follow the air into the back of your throat and observe the expansion of your chest and then how the belly moves out. And then as you breathe in and out, noticing the rising and falling of your belly, the opening and closing of your chest. And your mind may have already wandered off because that's what the mind does. But what we say in insightful meditation is the mind is like the ocean. We cannot stop the 
waves, but we can surf them. So let the thoughts be there whilst you bring your attention back to the breath. Just taking note of where is it that the air is going. Noticing the touch again with the nostrils and the nasal mucosa. Observing the opening and closing of the chest and the rising and falling of the belly. Breathing in and out. And if there's any sensation in your shoulders, bringing your attention to that. If there's any tightness in any of the muscles, noticing that. And as you're breathing in and out, watching your temples and seeing if there's any tightness there and bringing your attention back to the breath. Breathing in and out and actually noticing the marvel of your breath because with every new breath, there's a new life. Because when we stop breathing, life stops. So perhaps even being grateful for the new breath as it's coming in and out. Imagining the breath flowing through the scalp into the nape of your neck and into your forehead and into the eyelids. And as you're breathing in and out, letting the thoughts be, as the breath flows into the angle of your jaw, Noticing if there's any tightness in the face anywhere. And imagining the breath flowing through the shoulders into your arms. So breathing in and out. Watching your breath. Allowing the breath to flow through the body. And then whenever you're ready, opening your eyes and noticing for yourself, what is it that you are feeling? What is it that's coming up for you? And just making that observation. So our breath is our anchor because it's always with us. We don't have to think of another anchor and we can utilize this practice anytime, anywhere. When you become aware of your sympathetic stimulation in situations of conflict, you might think, oh, this is the time I can actually focus on two or three breaths. You don't even have to use many breaths, two or three breaths. And that's all it takes to activate your vagus to balance the sympathetic. I'll stop there. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take those or we can do them later, whichever. Thank you. Thank you, Poonam. That was so, so, so beautiful. What I realized was that every time we take our attention to some part of our body, like the temples or the nape of our neck, which you cleverly took us to, so those areas, actually, the muscles, you can feel them relaxing. And I've often wondered why meditators like you look so beautiful. We met yesterday evening and I'm constantly thinking, why do people like you look so beautiful? It's because that pinched look or that pinched thing of your muscles, when it relaxes, so that relaxation and that pinched look, when it goes, it makes you very naturally beautiful inside and out. And with all our viewers, I do want to share uh, that thing that you touched about selfishness because people think that it is something very very bad to be selfish like you defined the difference between selfishness and self-love but there is a book by a very very great philosopher Ayn Rand A-Y-N Ayn Rand the virtue of selfishness it is worth a read Thank you. And if there are any questions, we will take it. Um, there is one question in chat box. Uh, that, I have said that one. 
Yeah, I think I was brain. Uh, asked by Dr. Nirita only, is the limbic brain same as the reptilian brain? Yeah. 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 So if... The, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Poonam. And if there is no question here, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions yeah. inside of them and they will need to meet you. Uh, so I now yeah. hand over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shobha. Nirja, there is one... One question by Dr. Amrit Gupta. What should we do if we have any distraction in the surroundings? I think they are referring to the meditation time that we are saying. I think, uh, will it not be necessary to have a private space while doing that? Because we can easily get disturbed. Yeah. yeah it, it, yes, you can. And that is where brain training comes in. So when you're first learning to meditate, what I say is, uh, especially with the breath, you can do it first thing in the morning and you don't like you don't have to focus on uh, doing half an hour of meditation just set an intent for I will focus on five breaths and if a thought comes and I realize that I haven't done five breaths I'll come back to the breath and I'll do it for and notice how many breaths I can focus on without a thought thoughts will float around but without me going into the loop of thought and then it becomes very natural uh, after a little while so it is about uh, neuroplasticity and changing our brain. There are many functional MRI studies that there are changes in the frontal cortex, insula, amygdala, once we start to go on this road. Uh, you know what, uh, I, I, am, uh, I am Dr. Shobha Guri, uh, Dr. Poonam, and uh, I, I, I really compliment Dr. Pushpa Sethi, Dr. Arti Gupta, and Dr. Nitya Chawla for having you know, brought you onto this forum and uh, allowed this interaction. I think it was amazing the way you spoke. Uh, and I, I am seeing a full circle here. I feel that you have connected mind and body and soul and the heart, I think, and uh, all the elements. And um, we, we are now seeing that meditation, in fact, can connect us to our prayers. And we are also seeing that the way you told to focus, the same focus which we use while praying, and we are realizing that meditation and uh, focus and prayers will change uh, the, the uh, probably the biochemical endocrine processes in the brain. So somewhere the matter connects to the mind in a very tangible way, and, and the result is extremely good for our health for our emotional health especially and for the confidence level and this is in some way has a very high pertinence to the the psyche of a menopausal woman because it is so rapidly changing she has to adjust to so many things and this is the time when she requires self-esteem and self-worth and uh, your session is very fruitful for that mm -hmm. thank you so much for being here i think mm -hmm. i leave the other uh, faculty to say something about this yeah Thank you, Dr. Poonam. It's a really eye-opener session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Poonam. I think the best thing that you have told us in meditation, it does not mean that you your mind should be absolutely blank. It cannot be blank. The thoughts will be there. And at times when people think they have failed in meditation, actually they have not. Uh, just concentrating on your breath. And it's wonderful that you can start with even two breaths or five breaths, whatever you can, um, you know, start up with. And then gradually increasing. And the mind will float. So uh, concentrating on your breath. And actually you could feel whether air hits you first. So I think that is a really uh, you know, very important point you brought up. And I think we all can start meditating. It is not difficult at all. And uh, it really puts your mind at peace. I think uh, one very important thing was the connection where you feel your emotions. I think she touched on uh, where in the body do you feel love? So that also is a very important thing. Yes, because that was something striking you have and to... something very different, Nirja. I think uh, you are very right. That was something very different. Which, uh, I because mean, where, whenever you feel love or hate or anger is where your disease will actually begin. Yeah, Puna? Yes, yes. Because the cells have a memory and unbeknown to us, when we are in a state of, say, hate or anger, 
we are actually creating those chemicals and some of them would trigger gets you know trigger processes in the cells which eventually will lead to disease because every time we are angry we are storing that trauma so unless we learn to resolve and yesterday i was having a conversation and it was but we want to change the other person we cannot change another human being because they have their own uh, ecosystem I only know my ecosystem and I can only change that. So how I respond. So there's a difference between reaction and response. Reaction is coming from the limbic brain and it's very quick and it's actually a wired in response to the limbic brain thinking it's pro protecting me. That's my survival. But it's misreading that cue and all we have to say is, okay, I'm not a threat. Just because another person's upset with me that doesn't put me at any threat. And if I bring my cortical brain in, which is why we are at the top of the animal chain, then I can stop to say, I don't need to be angry, but it takes a lot of work because our limbic brain works, like I said, 95% of the times it's our limbic brain. So it takes a huge amount of work. I'm still on that journey 20 years later. That is a huge bit of information to process actually, Poonam, and I think this is not a one hour session. We carry with us so many messages for the rest of our lives from you. So thank you, Poonam, for thank that. you. Hopefully, you know, we will again, with Aarti's permission, we will bring you back again sometime. The 